studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. This is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Wednesday, February 18th, 2015. Obama's request for military authorization provides a unique opportunity for Congress to debate the ISIS war. That's according to my guest Andrew Basevich. And a report from West Virginia where a major oil spill from a train derailment sounds another warning bell. Plus a Black History special. We'll take a look at a new documentary today as American as Baseball, which examines the history of the Negro Baseball Leagues. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris. She is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. Well, President Obama will address a gathering of law enforcement and other officials this morning on day one of a three-day conference aimed at undermining recruitment efforts by groups like ISIS. Critics worry that the tactics that emerge from this gathering could include ongoing surveillance of communities domestically. Although the White House hoped the meeting's agenda would be set by community groups, many are boycotting it. Meanwhile, the State Department announced yesterday that the U.S. would begin selling armed drones to other countries. In response to the global public outcry against drone wars, the Obama administration was careful to outline a series of guidelines for the sale and use of the drones. The Washington Post summarized, quote, the new policy is a delicate balancing act for the Obama White House, which has sought to elevate human rights in its foreign policy, but has also employed drone strikes like no other government in history. Well, Courtney, I bet if the U.S. stopped selling and using armed drones to wage wars, that might be the most effective counter-recruitment strategy against ISIS. What do you think? Well, that's probably true, Sonali. I mean, this decision to uh, to expand the sale of armed drones to other countries is uh, is is just it's a, it's bad. I mean, let's be clear: the United States is hardly in a position to advise other countries about the safe and responsible use of armed drones. We know from a report that was released by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in the UK that as of January of last year, more than 2,400 people had been killed uh, with drones. The vast majority of them civilians. Many of those civilians children. And those are just the deaths that we can confirmed, the death toll is very likely, in fact, much higher. So uh, drones are a bad idea, and the idea that we're going to be expanding the sale and accessibility of them when we really should be scaling back our own use of them uh, is deeply troubling. Um, but there's one group of people who will be very happy about the expanded sale of drones, and that's weapons makers. Uh, mm -hmm. War is the business of the United States, and business is very good. The global drone market is estimated now to be worth about $6 billion. So I think we all know what this is really about. Outgoing U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder reiterated yesterday his personal opposition to the death penalty in an event at the National Press Club. In calling for a national moratorium on capital punishment, Holder said, quote, there's always the possibility that mistakes will be made. There is no ability to correct a mistake where somebody has, in fact, been executed. And that is, from my perspective, the ultimate nightmare, end of quote. Holder did not bring up his support for the death penalty in the trial of the Boston Marathon bomber Zokar Sarnayev. While his words have little legal impact, they reflected an increasing opposition to the death penalty. On Friday, Pennsylvania's Governor Tom Wolf announced a moratorium in his state, calling it, quote, a flawed system that was ineffective, unjust, and expensive. Meanwhile, Holder's likely replacement, Loretta Lynch, who is still in the middle of confirmation hearings, is a supporter of capital punishment, saying it was, quote, effective. Courtney, are you amazed that we continue to have debate and opposing views on the death penalty when most of the rest of the industrialized world has just done away with it? Well, I can't say that I'm particularly surprised by this Sonali. I mean, I, I grew up uh, most of my life on military bases in Texas and other parts of the South, and, and that's a part of the country where the death penalty remains hugely popular. Uh, there's a lot of popular support for it. Um, but I think that uh, Attorney General Holder is absolutely right on this issue. The death penalty does need to be abolished. It doesn't work as a deterrent for crime. It's expensive. And we know that mistakes are made and innocent people have been executed. And so it seems that he's really in step with uh, a lot of where the country 
country is moving, where the tide of public opinion does seem to be shifting on the question of the death penalty. Here in Pennsylvania, for example, our new governor has uh, issued a moratorium uh, on the death penalty until a commission that he is appointed can review the efficacy of that measure uh, and whether we should continue to, uh, to practice that here in the state. So even though there are places in the country where I think there's still a lot of support for the death penalty, there seems to be enough of a concern uh, that it doesn't actually work uh, as a strategy for deterring crime and that there are too many mistakes that are made to make it a viable strategy for policing and, and criminal justice. And finally, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, it's making headlines for its controversial decision to bar Iranian students from pursuing graduate degrees in certain science fields. In making its decision, the university cited broad U.S. sanctions that include denying U.S. student visas to Iranian nationals who want to study nuclear and energy-related sciences. But speaking through an anonymous official, the U.S. State Department countered that UMass might have interpreted the sanctions too strictly. The official told the L.A. Times, quote, U.S. law does not prohibit qualified Iranian nationals coming to the U.S. for education in science and engineering. The move has angered Iranian student groups and community organizations who feel UMass Amherst is adopting a discriminatory policy. Courtney, what do you think is behind the uh, university's decision? It says it doesn't want to be penalized for violating sanctions, but the State Department says it's not a violation of sanctions. Well, I mean, I honestly can't say at this point what the motivation is um, and why you, why you met, why you met. UMass Amherst, apologies, is uh, <laughs> is enacting this policy at this point, especially three years after these sanctions were enacted by the government. Um, it seems like the kind of preemptive strike thinking that always gets us into trouble. Um, and it's clear that UMass Amherst is out of line here. The law is very clear. The State Department is the entity that is responsible for determining whether students from Iran um, are entering the United States with the purposes of acquiring skills that will then allow them to go back and to support the development of Iran's uh, oil, gas, natural gas and, uh, and nuclear energy industry. So it's not really clear here why UMass is doing this, but it clearly is a discriminatory policy. They are overstepping their bounds um, and engaging in the kind of zealous over-policing of Iranian students that uh, is completely in contradiction with its core institutional values. Courtney, always a pleasure to have you on. We'll talk to you next week. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. We'll be right back. Uprising, I'm Sonali Kohatkar. You can now watch Uprising on Free Speech TV, which airs on Dish Network Channel 9415, Direct TV Channel 348, and on hundreds of part-time cable affiliates and on Roku. Earlier this month, President Obama formally sought congressional approval for the war against ISIS that he launched six months earlier. The move gives Congress the opportunity to debate the war, but it appears as though many members of Congress feel the war authorization is too broad. Still others, like Senator John McCain, think it's too narrow. Obama had initially cited the 2001 military authorization obtained by President Bush as justifying his actions in northern Iraq and Syria. If Congress does not approve his submitted request, he simply has the option to fall back on the 2001 authorization. But my guest, Andrew Basevich, sees Obama's request for permission for war as, quote, an extraordinary opportunity. He draws a historical comparison to President Richard Nixon's expansion of the Vietnam War to Cambodia in 1970. Andrew Basevich is a professor of international relations and history at Boston University. He's a former career army officer, author of a number of books, including Washington Rules, America's Path to Permanent War. Welcome to Uprising. Professor Basevich. 
Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we are going to call you right back because it appears that we can't actually uh, hear your audio. Professor Andrew Basevich, again, his book is called Washington Rules, America's Path to Permanent War, a career military man himself and now a critic of U.S. wars. And uh, he's also a professor at uh, Boston University. Uh, when we're talking about the authorization for military, uh, uh, the military authorization that President President Obama has requested from Congress. Uh, does it uh, look like we have Mr. Basevich with us? I can hear Hi, you. Great, we've got you on. Okay, well, first, okay. how is the 1970 request for war by Nixon a, a good comparison to today? Well, there was no request back in 1970. Uh, just, just to recall the history. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the spring of 1970, Richard Nixon, without getting anybody's advance permission, uh, invaded Cambodia, thereby expanding the Vietnam War. And the point of the analogy is to say that that, in effect, is what President Obama has done with regard to ISIS. There's this ongoing war, the, the war we used to call a, a, a war uh, against terrorism. He has now expanded it, and, and then having expanded it, as you said in your initial remarks, now he's asking for permission. My argument is simply that if we imagine back in 1970 that after Nixon invaded Cambodia, he had gone to the Congress and said to the Congress, please authorize me to do what I have already done. We don't know how Congress would have reacted, but my speculation is that they would not have simply debated whether or not to give permission to invade, invade, uh, invade Cambodia. I believe that they would actually have used that occasion to initiate a far more far-ranging debate about the Vietnam War and more broadly about U.S. policy in the Cold War. And it seems to me that's the opportunity that the Congress has right now that they ought to capitalize on. Mm -hmm. Not to talk about whether or not to go fight ISIS, but to use this occasion to take stock of this decades-long uh, military enterprise that we have been engaged in uh, in the uh, in the greater Middle East. Hmm. So in, in asking for Congress's permission, President Obama has uh, provided an opportunity that the 1970 Congress didn't have, but ought to have had. Um, some have also compared ISIS to the Khmer Rouge, a communist group in Cambodia, notorious for its killings and torture. And just as that uh, rebel group offered up the sort of perfect evil bogeyman for the U.S. to expand its war, do you see ISIS offering the same thing today and, and sort of offering the same trap today that the U.S. is falling in? Oh, I think so. And, 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 and I mean, we need to be very careful here. ISIS is an evil and mm -hmm. terrible organization. Uh, there's no way uh, in which one could offer any defense of the actions that they have undertaken. That said, we should separate that from the larger question of what exactly is the United States trying to accomplish in its military engagement in the Islamic world? To what degree have our efforts thus far produced success? Uh, what is the likelihood of simply trying harder is going to produce success in the future? Indeed, I would argue that it may well be imperative for us to destroy ISIS, and yet, even if we do so, even if, even if tomorrow we could declare victory over ISIS, by no means would that somehow suggest that our larger military efforts in the region are on track for success, because they're not. Now, uh, just st sticking with the comparison to the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, before Nixon expanded the war there, the group was able to boast about 4,000 members. After five years of bombing, its ranks had swelled to over 70,000. And aren't we simply in going after ISIS the way in which we have, uh, which is, you know, essentially firepower, um, uh, indiscriminate firepower that we are likely to have a similar outcome, fueling the ranks of this organization that is, as you've said, quite vile and evil. Well, you could be right. Uh, but again, I would apply your point uh, more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it's it, different presidents at different times 
have made different claims about what we're trying to do in that region, whether we're trying to protect the oil, spread democracy, bring stability, uh, put ourselves in a position to dominate. The, the stated purpose of U.S. military efforts has varied from time to time. What has not varied, and this gets to your point, what has not varied is the results. And, and the result is that uh, far from bringing stability or, or, or spreading democracy, the, the presence of U.S. forces, the actions of U.S. forces have actually uh, deepened the problems afflicting the region. Uh, and again, the imperative, it seems to me, uh, in, in Washington is to, is to accept, to grasp uh, that essential fact and then to begin to ask, what are the implications? Hmm. If indeed U.S. military efforts have proven to be a failure, well, then what? What are the alternative approaches to U.S. policy that deserve examination? And that's, I wanna... the, that's the debate I'd like to see. Right. And I want to ask your opinion on that. But uh, speaking of disastrous results, it was just a report out today uh, of the uh, of the um, situation in Afghanistan, where the record number of people in 2014 were killed, over 10,000 Afghans killed. That's the highest number since 2008. So uh, we see, of course, the results of our war efforts there as well. Now, uh, how do you explain the narrowness of the authorization that President Obama has requested? Some say in some sense it's overly broad, because, of course, as Commander-in-Chief, Obama essentially claims the right to wage the war as he sees fit. But he's clarified within this authorization uh, no enduring ground combat forces. Is he looking for a way out that if this war is long and protracted, like the Iraq war, he can say, well, Congress approved it, or I offered Congress the chance to approve this. Well, I, I think uh, I think the language is uh, exceedingly uh, soft. I mean, tell me what the word enduring means. Hmm. Uh, so it's vague. It, 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 and, and the prohibition is, is, is for against an enduring ground offensive. Well, does that permit uh, enduring air offensives? Does it, it permit in, enduring ground defensive operations? In other words, if uh, indeed ISIS posed a direct threat to uh, Baghdad, could the president uh, deploy uh, two or three U.S. Army divisions under the terms of this authorization and say, I'm simply doing this to defend. I'm not engaged in offensive operations. So uh, it seems to me that the, the, the language that currently exists pretty much allows the president to do whatever he wants to do. He'll be able to, to find weasel words that will enable him uh, to use force as he wishes. Of course, again, you made the point in your introductory remark, e even if this authorization does not pass, the president still can uh, use the, the 2001 authorization as, as the default that allows him to do what he wants to anyway. So it's a very strange kind of political dance that's going on. Right. So, Andrew Basevich, do you see any members of Congress or significant faction within Congress that would take this opportunity that you've called extraordinary to debate the war? And if so, what are some alternatives that they could offer to Obama's approach to dealing with ISIS? Well, on the first question, sadly, no. Yeah. I don't, I, I haven't, maybe I'm not following it closely enough, but I haven't seen any significant member of Congress uh, stand up and say, "Hey, wait a second. Let's 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 use this as a chance to ask some more fundamental questions. Uh, whether they're whether they lack the critical ability to see the opportunity, or whether more likely uh, they're, they're, uh, the problem is one of political cowardice, uh, I don't know. Personally, I think that uh, there really are. I think there's two major uh, strategic choices." The one choice for those who believe, and there are people who honestly believe, that military action is the only solution to the dysfunction in that part of the Islamic world, then I would argue that we're going to have to undertake military action on a vastly larger scale than we have up to this point. And if you want to, if you want to bring order to Afghanistan or you want to bring order to uh, Iraq, 
we're gonna ha we're gonna have to send a half a million troops to each one of those countries and probably leave them there for 20 years. If you believe in a military solution, then it seems to me that's where the military solution <laughs> lies. My preferred alternative would be to say, no, right. there is no plausible, affordable military solution, and therefore the United States should should revert to a strategy of containment, analogous to, but not identical with, the strategy of containment that guided U.S. policy through the Cold War. That implies a, a radical reduction of the U.S. military presence in the Islamic world. It implies devoting far more resources to erecting de effective defenses to any violence emanating from that part of the world. Mm. Uh, finally, Andrew Basevich, there was a poll by CNN this week that found that a majority of Americans now disapprove of Obama's handling of the war. 57 percent uh, disapprove. That's up from 49 percent last September. And this is because they think the war is going badly. Uh, CNN had this takeaway from the poll results, quote, the survey suggests Americans are warming up to the idea of sending ground troops to combat the terrorist organization. Is this poll result and even CNN's interpretation of it a major failure of our establishment media? Well, I don't know if it's a failure of the establishment media, but I think the, the interpretation is suspect. My, my guess, I'm not an expert on public opinion, my guess is that a public opinion reacts to these highly visible, right. highly publicized murders of small numbers of people necessarily, understandably. That evokes a sense of outrage. And so when somebody, uh, you know, calls you on the telephone and says, what do you want to do? Uh, going to war uh, looks like a good idea. Now, if we did indeed commit substantial ground forces once again to Iraq after having, after, after an eight-year-long war that failed, uh, my guess is that uh, public opinion would uh, rather quickly uh, uh, change and, and would find that, uh, would object to uh, being stuck in yet another quagmire. Well, I want to thank you very much, Andrew Basevich, for joining us today. Thank you. Andrew Basevich has been my guest. He's a professor of international relations and history at Boston University. He's written a number of books, including Washington Rules, America's Path to Permanent War. To Uprising, I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. You can now watch Uprising online at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Uprising with Sonali. Please do subscribe. A train carrying crude Bakken oil through a rural part of West Virginia derailed on Monday afternoon, causing more than two dozen tankers out of 109 to fall two of which tumbled into a nearby river and 15 of which caught on fire. A local house was set on fire and thousands of residents have been evacuated. Because the oil spilled into a part of the Kanaha River near an uptake area for a drinking water system, residents have been asked to consume bottled water for now. Millions of gallons of crude oil may have spilled. The accident took place during a severe winter storm, forcing cleanup crews to let the resulting fires burn out on their own. It's not known if the snowfall, measuring 5 to 7 inches in some places, may have played a role in the derailment. West Virginia Governor Earl Ray Tobin has declared a state of emergency for the region. Officials from the Federal Railroad Administration are traveling to the southern part of West Virginia, where the derailment happened, to evaluate the crash site. Three days before the West Virginia spill, another oil-carrying train derailed in Ontario, Canada. Less than a year ago, a, tra a train carrying the same kind of oil, operated by the same company, CSX, derailed in Lynchburg, Virginia. And in 2013, a devastating oil spill from a train accident in Quebec 
killed 47 people. The Bakken oil from North Dakota, which was being transported in West Virginia, is apparently a particularly flammable type of oil, which is considered very dangerous to transport by rail. And yet, about three-fourths of North Dakota's oil is moved through the country by train. My guest is Bob Kincaid. He's a progressive radio host based in rural West Virginia and co-founder of the Head On Radio Network, or HORN. Welcome to Uprising, Bob. Good morning, Sonali. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, can you tell us the latest on the West Virginia spill in terms of the impact that it's had on local communities? As far as you know, is it known now if the drinking water supply has really been affected? Are people quite worried? I think people have a right to be worried. I was through the area yesterday twice, and uh, local restaurants were still closed. They had signs on their door saying closed due to lack of water. The water system in intakes were eventually shut down, although similar to what happened a year ago, there was a period of time in which uh, I guess authorities weren't sure whether or not they should stop the intakes from taking in potential uh, crude oil. So um, it seems as though the growing problem of transporting oil by trains is impacting more and more people. Um, is this incident affecting West Virginia, you know, uh, similar to the one in Lynchburg, Virginia, last year? Is it something that people in the region are realizing is an inevitable outcome of this method of transportation and also our reliance on fossil fuels? I don't think, Sonali, that most people even know that these things are traveling through their backyards, by their houses, uh, through their cities. And, and, and this isn't just an Appalachia problem. This is a United States problem. These trains are going through California. They're going to the East Coast. They're going, obviously, through Canada. Uh, another train exploded uh, a little more than a year ago, I think, in Pickens County, Alabama. And because of the veil of secrecy that has been dropped around their movements, uh, with, for instance, West Virginia's state government declaring that telling uh, the potential victims of these explosions what the routes are of the trains uh, are trade secrets. No, I, I think people are deliberately being kept in the dark. For instance, uh, very few people know, Sonali, that this train that blew up a couple of days ago was actually on the way into a national park. They, they go through a national park every day. They travel underneath uh, an interstate bridge that carries thousands of automobiles per day. No one knows. So what about the fact that the oil that is being carried is extremely flammable and these trains that um, in, in question by this company CSX um, are a particular model that has been implicated in these kinds of accidents over and over again. Are these possibly avoidable accidents? I think the best way to avoid these accidents, Sonali, is to stop doing it because essentially what you have here is a complete violation of any notion of the precautionary principle. You have a situation taking place in which oil companies and their enablers, the rail companies, are transporting this stuff, uh, ultra-hazardous, inherently dangerous activity, without regard to the safety and well-being of people. And it leads to, I think, uh, what I think is a fair question, and that is how much sacrifice are these oil companies willing to ask of their victims before they actually, before something gets done? Right. I mean, in this particular instance, uh, nobody was killed. But <clears throat> I mentioned in Quebec a couple of years ago, 47 people died from a train accident, a train carrying oil that exploded. I mean, we could have potentially, any one of these derailments here in the U.S. could have a similar impact. Absolutely, and it needs to be understood that while most of the coverage has said that 15 cars derailed in this particular instance, this bomb train, and that's a term of art that railroad people started using. Bomb this train? Bomb, bomb trains. Yeah, yeah, there's a hashtag even, bomb huh. trains. Uh, this, this particular bomb train was, had 107 of these cars attached to it. And in point of fact, just before it derailed, it had gone through neighborhoods. It had gone through small towns. It had gone through Charleston, West Virginia, the state capital. And, was, and, and uh, for instance, the same route, it's the same rail line where one exploded last spring in, uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia. Right. The other point I'd like to make is that I don't think it is fair to say, oh, it was the cold weather or, oh, it's the hot weather. These things explode at any time, anywhere, North Dakota, Alabama, 
uh, West Virginia, Virginia, Canada. There's no there's no weather commonality there. We're talking about a, a railroad system that is poorly maintained where all of the profits are poured into shareholders and very little is poured into maintenance where accidents can be written off immediately, but the uh, the, the cost of maintenance is not so, e so easy to right. deal with. And so consequently, you have a recipe for disaster. The other part of this is the inherent volatility of this Bakken crude. It doesn't have to be this way, but that's the way they ship it. This stuff is just raw, and it's actually, according to the experts that I've talked to, more volatile than gasoline. Now, and we're also talking about trains that are extremely long. I mean, 109 cars on one train, which e with each uh, train car being, you know, pretty significantly long. Uh, so when one uh, part of the train gets derailed, uh, we have the potential to have so many tankers filled with this crude oil um, potentially exploding. I mean, are, do they have to be this long? They do if you want to maximize corporate profits over, right. over the well-being of the people whose homes and communities they're passing through. And that seems to be the operating philosophy scenario. Hmm. Now, uh, West Virginia is a coal country. It's a state whose economy has been built on dirty energy. And, of course, uh, the main way that the corporations have sold this industry to ordinary people is jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, how uh, are you seeing people start to reevaluate this approach when you have accidents such as this? A little bit, uh, especially among the core of us that, uh, that know exactly what things like mountaintop removal do to human beings. There are more than two dozen peer-reviewed science journal articles now, Sonali, that show, for instance, that mountaintop removal coal mining it brings about a host of plague of human illnesses, everything from cancer to heart disease to a number of birth defects. We've got a brand new bill introduced in the Congress, H.R. 912. It is the Appalachian Communities Health Emergency Act. It's the only bill that's ever been introduced that would have the power to end mountaintop removal. The, but but there's, I guess you could say here in coal country and in, in central Appalachia, it is as if we have a bit of Stockholm syndrome with a banjo soundtrack. <laughs> uh, we we have people we 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 are a culture who says, well, golly, if the coal industry stops burning us up and blowing us up and killing us in Slate Falls and poisoning our children at the foot of these mountains, what will we ever do for jobs? Hmm. Well, what about the company in question in this particular incident we're discussing, CSX? Has it taken any responsibility? Um, and, and our federal regulators, um, some of whom I understand have been traveled to the area, uh, the Federal Railroad Commission, have they uh, done their job in holding a company like CSX accountable? Oh, heavens, no. Uh, accountability is something for people, not corporations. The, the fact of the matter is the only accountability I've heard of is that CSX, through one of its public relations people, said that the man whose house they blew up and burned down, who was forced to flee into the frozen uh, the, the frozen day in nothing but his bare feet, whose wife was already in the hospital uh, uh, for heart surgery, uh, all they've said is that he will be compensated fully. Hmm. Of course, the cynic that I am, my first thought is, yeah, sure. He'll be compensated fully as long as CSX gets to define what compensated fully right. means. Right. How There's do you compensate for your entire house being destroyed? You can't compensate for the memories lost or, I mean, it's just. <laughs> no, uh, the only way to do that would be the, to, to, to write the number one and then just start writing zeros until, you're, <laughs> un, until your wrist goes numb. That's not going to happen here. It never happens here. You, you see, you have to understand that CSX, is the successor in interest to what was called Chessy, which before that was the CNO Railroad, which has been mm. part and parcel of the long-term abuse of Central Appalachia. Wow. Well, I want to appreciate, Bob, you're putting all of this into context, and uh, we'll certainly be following this story, uh, particularly as the drinking water might uh, be impacted. I want to thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Sonali, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of life in the sacrifice zone with your viewers. <laughs> My guest is uh, uh, Bob Kincaid. He's a progressive radio host based in rural West, West Virginia, co-founder of the Head On Radio Network, and he's been telling us about the impact of the oil spill from the train derailment that took place earlier this week. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.
Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. The history of sports in the United States is deeply wrapped up in the history of racial politics. Today, as part of our ongoing Black History Month coverage, we turn to that all-American sport, baseball. In the early part of the 20th century, African Americans were barred from playing on professional teams alongside whites. So they formed what became known as the Negro Leagues, featuring such legendary players as Jackie Robinson and Satchel Paige. Southern Californians know the name Jackie Robinson so well, he became the first African American to play in Major League Baseball, breaking the color line for legions of others. Now a new documentary called As American as Baseball examines the impact of the Negro Baseball League on the sport and on the cultural and political landscape of the United States. Joining me in studio is the director of the film, Ayo Henderson, and welcome to Uprising. Hello, Sonali. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, first, um, how do you um, explain the importance of the Negro Baseball League to particularly younger viewers and listeners in our audience who may know and love baseball but just may not know the history of this aspect of it? Well, I think that's the, the main issue. Most people just don't know the history because they, it hasn't been taught to them. Um, so when we got introduced to it, it kind of just, um, it, it was a whirlwind. We couldn't believe how much information and how much stuff actually happened um, around the turn of the century. And how did you first come upon this history? Well, we, we met a, a player, a Negro League player, also a Major League player, um, by the name of Sweet Lou Johnson, played for the Dodgers, actually hit a home run in, I believe, in 65 to win against Minnesota to uh, help him win that title. Um, but he introduced us to the Negro League he basically told us, um, you know, how difficult it was for these players to integrate into the league. Um, and after, you know, years and years of, of developing an amazing enterprise, um, the Negro Leagues, it got, it got shut down. Um, and primarily because the Major League took the best players. Mm -hmm. They took the best players out of the Negro Leagues um, and, and systematically brought them into the Major Leagues. But instead of bringing them into the, to the, um, to the majors, they went to the minors. Hmm. Um, so, so they didn't even really get, you know, their their time to shine. And I want to get into that later part of, uh, you know, the transformation, the evolution of this. But first, let's um, uh, pl uh, play a, sh a short clip from your documentary, As American as Baseball. Uh, you've done a lot of <clears throat> groundwork in, in terms of just uh, uh, original interviews uh, with major people in this, uh, uh, that know a lot about this issue personally. Um, and here's a short excerpt of the film, As American as Baseball. really get a sense of the history you know you can you hear about it and, and it's not in the history books like it should be talked about or the famous entertainers Frank Sinatra Billy Eckstein Billy Eckstein was my good buddy Nat King Cole and, and hear some of the stories that they told about how they were treated and going to Las Vegas for instance they had to eat in the kitchen they had to come in the back door they could get on the stage and perform and all these white people shaking and rattles and clapping their hands and all that, but they couldn't eat in the, in the dining room. Dorothy Dandridge couldn't swim in the swim pool. She couldn't sit on the deck of the swim pool either. And the white race enjoyed our talents, but they didn't want anything to do with us personally. They want us close to them. They want us touching them. 
I wonder why. If it wasn't for the Negro Leagues, we wouldn't be in the big leagues. So, uh, you know, that's where it all started for us. But see, a lot of people now, they don't know about this because the history we get is usually from the 60s forward, now from the Martin, which is cool, but there was history going on, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, uh, Charlie Parker. <laughs> And that is an excerpt of the documentary as American as Baseball, whose director, Ayo Henderson, joins me in studio. Now, the, uh, how was it that the, what was the story of the Negro Baseball Leagues um, eventually feeding Major League Baseball these incredible players, of Jackie Robinson being the first of them? How did that even come about? And, and this happened at a time uh, almost, uh, actually, even before the Civil Rights Movement reached its peak. Yeah, it was um, 20 years before the Civil Rights. I believe Jackie or um, Martin Luther King was a sophomore in Morehouse when Jackie Robinson signed in '47. And the '40s in America is when you know kind of the integration really started, and, and it was mainly in sports. I believe basketball was the first sport to get integrated, as far as black teams playing against white teams. Um, of course, the World War Two, the war, war came, and then a lot of these players. Um, or black men had to go to the war, and when they came out, you know, they were kind of like, you know, what's going on? You know, I had to go fight for this country, but I had to come back here now um, and, and, and get treated this way. Um, so, yeah, when, when Jackie signed, it was like a, it was a pivotal moment, you know, because everyone, you know, the black community wanted more. Um, they wanted to be able to integrate. They wanted a chance to be able to go walk down the street and not feel threatened or be able to go shop wherever they wanted. And how did the public view uh, the Negro Leagues as well as the the beginning of integration of Major League Baseball, um, both black and white communities in the United States? Well, I think if you were a baseball fan, um, it didn't matter. It was all about the game. Um, so you had plenty of integration, even in the Negro Leagues, um, turn of the century, um, that you know, people were going to watch the baseball players, and it didn't matter what color the you know the audience was. They were they were going to see some amazing ball players. Mm. And because this was before uh, integration uh, was you know in full force, or before integration even really began, what sort of life did some of these players experience on the field versus off the field? Well, before signing, um, things were I, I wouldn't say good, but you know. The black community was forced to 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 be on its own. This was during Jim Crow, you know, 1877 to 1960, I believe that thing lasted, the big sink and the little sink. So um, these players were, you know, were, were forced to, to deal with them, themselves and deal with their own community. And there weren't too many jobs. They were developing their own jobs. They were developing their own systems. And in that time, it was, it was kind of one of the things you could do as a young black man was get into sports, you could get into baseball, and you could um, perhaps, you know, feed your family. Hmm. So while a lot of people know about Jackie Robinson breaking the color line in Major League Baseball, they don't know as much about what happened within the Negro Leagues. And, um, and one of the things that your documentary, I think, really points out is the influence of this institution to baseball as a whole. There were a lot of things that I understand that we see even today that originated with the Negro Leagues. Yeah, right? absolutely. I, you know, they were really innovative. Um, for example, the, the first night games in baseball in America were the Negro League games. They actually developed these lights um, because there was such a need um, to, to see these ball games and people wanting to come see. They started, you know, having games back to back to back. Um, the Major League at the same time thought there was no way people would come and watch night games. Um, and the Negro League showed that that's not true. You know, people will come, they'll come out and watch this. Mm. Um, and also, you know, things like, you know, the advent of speed. They didn't have the same, you know, they were fast. Um, they were stealing bases. Uh, Major League wasn't really, wasn't really doing that. So they brought this kind of excitement to the game that wasn't there before. Now, this was also an international institution. I understand that they were accepted players from around the world. Absolutely. And well, they even went abroad to play. Yeah, well, even in America, there was, you know, there wasn't too much integration, but there were some teams that they played with that were white. Um, there was a, a House of David, the Jewish team that, that traveled and barnstormed alongside the Negro Leagues. Um, they also went down to South America, to Mexico, where they were, you know, treated like kings. Pretty much everywhere they went, um, it was it was all about them being amazing ball players. And did some players decide uh, not to return to the U.S.? As oh, absolutely. Well? I mean, yeah, you have guys that went to Japan and never came back because you know they knew if they came back to America, they weren't going to be treated the same way, um, and, and they weren't, you know, they'd have to lose that or hold that, you know, that in that pride. You know, um, I think it was, it was, you know. 
it was smart for a lot of people to do that, but it was also, you know, smart for the guys that did stay just so that um, things could change in America because that was the first integration in America, um, baseball, and that changed that that changed the whole scope. Right. So, Ayo, you're the director of this documentary, Is American as Baseball. The documentary, I understand, is almost ready. Um, what are your challenges to completing this right now? How can our audience who might be excited about wanting to watch this participate in the release of the film? Well, we've shot over 35 interviews with some, um, some, some greats, major leaguers, Hall of Famers, and some Negro League guys, um, also some historians. Um, but yes, right now we're doing an Indiegogo campaign. Um, we are probably about 85% through with the editing. But what we're our funding is really for is to um, to license footage. There's lots of footage out there, lots of great black and white stuff that we haven't really seen before. Uh, most of the time you see these documentaries, you've seen you know you see the same footage over and over again. Um, so right now we're launching an Indiegogo campaign. You can go to indiegogocom slash baseball or you can go to our Facebook, facebookcom slash baseball and check out some of the footage. Check out some of the the stories that we're we're giving out right now. Um, for you to see. That's Indiegogo.com slash as American as baseball. And, and I want to sort of uh, pivot to the challenges of making such a film for independent filmmakers, especially. I mean, now people are increasingly uh, crowdfunding their projects to get the public on board because there's such a hunger for these kinds of projects, but of course, not necessarily big money willing to take a chance on projects like this. Um, so I'm sure this must have been a bit of a labor of love. I don't think you're necessarily a full time filmmaker. Right? No, I'm not a full-time <laughs> filmmaker, I, and I am a, um, a, a business owner as well. Um, Sidewalk Cafe in Pasadena, um, but yes. Um, so th this is quite a challenging thing to make a film. Yeah, you well, you don't know, we're, have massive capital. We you know we were a young black production company starting out, and when we when we got the story, we knew we had to tell the story one way or another. Um, and in, in that in that time, in the last few years, we've had lots of interest. People really love the doc. Um, and for one reason or another, it, uh, we just weren't able to secure the funding. And at this point right now, we believe, you know, the, the people need to see this. And it's something that we want to bring to the people directly. Um, and, you know, we'd rather um, take this route um, than going the route that we were trying to go before, which is going to Hollywood and trying to get all the big names and producers involved with it. Um, but right now, like I said, we, we've, we've garnered over 35 interviews and we're ready to complete the film. We just need to get some licensing, some original sounds, some original scores. So also, if you have you know, all those um, uh, producers out there, if you think maybe you have some good sounds or good themes that might be able to help, you know, please go to our Facebook, send us a message, or go to our Indiegogo. So I want to pick up on what you just said, which is trying to go to a place like Hollywood to make a film like this. Um, it's, you know, there have been films made. I mean, the, there have been feature films made. There was a film, 42, about Jackie Robinson a few years ago. Um, but how important is it, in your mind, for black filmmakers to tell their own stories? Well, that's, that's the thing. 42 was really, it was a really good movie. Um, but unfortunately, it just didn't tell the life um, of those ball players during that time. Um, you got a little snippet of how, how Jackie was treated. Um, but and once you see this documentary and some of the clips from the documentary, you'll see that it was really, really difficult for Jackie. Not just Jackie, but Don Newcomb, Roy Campanella, um, those three guys for the Brooklyn Dodgers, they had to stick together. So when the white players were getting on a bus, air-conditioned bus, these guys had to go get a cab um, and find whatever hotel that would house them. Um, and then, you know, meet back at the ball club to, to, to play a game. And then when they came out on the field, you know, they played their hearts out. Um, and you could tell right after the integration of baseball for the next 10 or 15 years, all the MVPs, all the Cy Youngs, all the, 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 the best players were African American. Um, and then slowly it, it started to decrease for multiple reasons. Um, right today, baseball is not a, a game where you see that many African Americans. No, yes, and the African Americans you do see aren't African American. They're probably from um, from the islands. Um, the Caribbean. Yeah, right now I believe the game is less than two percent, and wow. you know, we talk about that in the documentary. Also, we don't know exactly why. We got lots of different reasons why mm -hmm. people think um, that you know the, it, 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 it slowed down. Um, some people think there's no cheerleaders in baseball. Um, <laughs> there's, you know, there's, and, and, and you know that reason. You know, who knows what the real reason is? Um, we know that a lot of black players are going into basketball and football, um, but baseball, you know, is probably the highest paid sport. 
Um, ah, they, there's a hint. Yeah. Um, but let me ask you this now. I want to go back to something that you started out ta discussing, which is that when um, these incredible players um, who, because they were shut out of white teams, be uh, formed the Negro League Baseball, and when they finally did start being integrated into white teams, in a way that was sort of a bittersweet uh, occasion. You saw the beginning of the end of the Negro Leagues, that players were lost and never came back, and eventually the whole league was disbanded. And, and was that seen by some of the people that you interviewed as a loss? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, either, you know, Jackie Robinson or Martin Luther King today, if they saw the state of America, they wouldn't really be happy with it. But, yeah, we had female owners even in the Negro Leagues. Um, one of them was Etha Manley. And, you know, her thing was kind of guiding these players, including Jackie Robinson, that were going into the major leagues. She wanted to make sure that their contracts were right. Um, and then she also tried to talk to the different owners in the Negro League to tell them, yo, if you guys, if you don't, um, you know, give these guys the right contract or, or lead them in the right way, they're going to systematically take all these guys from your teams. And uh, sure enough, this is exactly what happened. All the best ball players from the Negro League systematically got pulled out, and then no one wanted to go watch the Negro Leagues anymore. Hmm. But in the in a way, uh, how do you respond to the fact that, uh, or to to what someone might say, which is that uh, that is the uh, a positive outcome of having integration, that you don't have a team that's defined by their racial identity? Right, and you know. And it's absolutely um, up up to debate, but um, I think what's not up to debate, debate is that it, um, at one point it was America's um, biggest black enterprise, um, and that you know we had hotels really? full. Yes, we had. You know, we were forced to we were forced to be on our own. Uh, the 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 white culture wasn't wasn't integrating with us. So we had our own cleaners, we had our own grocery stores, we had our own insurance companies, and and so this was the center of an industry. This was an industry in and of itself, is what you're saying. At, absolutely. At a time when it was very difficult to have these sorts of economically viable industries in the black community. Absolutely. I mean, next to you know entertainment, black entertainment today, the the biggest enterprise, you know, was the Negro Leagues and all the development, all the things that that it brought. Um, you know, and also, you know, we touch on a lot of different things, and a lot of it is is, is ownership. Um, we had a lot of different owners. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of different owners um, that that were giving back to their community directly, and you just even the ball players. You had these guys that were living in the same neighborhoods as a lot of these guys because. Um, you know, they couldn't go live in the Brentwoods or the Beverly Hills. So mm -hmm. you would see the Jackie Robinsons and the Don Newcombs in the street. You would see mm -hmm. them walking down the street. You know, you would see all these ball players that you wanted to see. You know, you went to see Satchel Paige, Cool Papa Bell, you know, and these guys were stars. You know, Cool Papa Bell was so fast, they say he could, you know, go turn off the lights and be in the bed before the lights got off. You know, <laughs> and obviously, you know, you, you know, these are stories that you hear, but these are the kind of stories that these kids grew up with um, and, you know, stories that made them feel like they were worth something. Ayo, how important is it for young folks in the United States today to know this history, whether they're sports fans or not, um, baseball fans or not? Do you feel that um, this story has a, a profound place in American history? Absolutely. You know, the black culture in America right now is having some difficult times. I think everybody kind of can see that. Um, and, but things were not like that um, 100 years ago. But weren't um, things worse 100 years ago? Well, things were worse. It depends on how you look at it. Yeah, so the, we were under Jim Crow. There was a little sink and the big sink. And yes, there was still lynching and, and these sorts of things happening. But you had black kids going to school and, and, and doing well in school, wanting to do well in school. Um, you had, like I said, black businesses. So it wasn't necessarily too difficult to. So, to what you're get saying a is a community reliant on itself because it was in a way forced to be. It was reliant forced on to. Species. Yeah, it was forced to. And now, you know, and now 2000, it's more bereft. Yeah, well, you know, there's no, there's no recycling of the black dollar well, because there's no black business. But everyone wants to point to Oprah Winfrey and Barack Obama as markers of success of the entire community. Absolutely, and they are markers of success. But, you know, um, we, had, we had the same type of Oprahs back there. We had a lady by the name of. The, Madam C.J. Walker, who was the first self-made woman millionaire in America, and it was from hair products. Mm -hmm. um, and she did extremely well, and she supported lots of businesses, um, lots of people. Um, I, I, where her estate is now, I don't, I don't think it's around anymore. 
But if you see pictures of her house and, you know, the things that she was doing, she was really, really classy. You know, it looks like some, the, the Hertz <laughs> castle or something, you nice. know, just the design, just the, 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 the architecture. She was, she was really, really smart. She was really gifted, but um, she absolutely gave back. And yeah, she was the first self-made woman millionaire in America. So you're talking about economic self-empowerment uh, that, uh, th that's one of the sort of morals of the story that you're trying to tell in the documentary that you want young folks to know about. Yeah, I want them to know that they that if society are, that kind of worth something. Society uh, leaves you out, you do it yourself. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, it's a story of uh, perseverance. Yeah, these guys, these guys had to struggle, and I think it's important for the young black men and women today to understand uh, all the sacrifices these, these men and women made for them to be in a position they are right now to to be successful. I think kind of that's like, that's the main thing the integration was, was for. Um, they wanted integration so that there would be an even playing field. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, maybe there is an even playing field, but you know, as far as the black culture is concerned, um, it, it's hard to see, you know? And I think a lot of it has to do with culture and not having anything to, to um, look up to, not having the black leaders, the, the, the doctors, the lawyers, the mechanics, and all these things that we had at one point. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see them now, so it's hard to see what you're supposed to be if there's not somebody that looks like you doing that. Mm -hmm. And you know, back in the turn of the century, we had all of that. We had all the different professionals because we were forced to. Right. And so um, finally then, uh, the Indiegogo campaign that you're relying on to help complete this years-long project that you've been involved and if you uh, make it and get this film done, what are your hopes for the kind of audience that you hope to reach? Are you hoping that a major uh, theater chain will distribute the film? Or, or you know, are you hoping that this becomes a sort of educational tool in schools? Well, absolutely it becomes an educational film. Um, whether or not it makes it to the theater isn't our main concern. Our main concern, I think, is that it gets to the screens of uh, um, as many Americans as possible. You know, it's an all-American story. It's a story that Americans typically embrace. Um, and it's important for us to start this dialogue to start talking about it. America's really young. Um, civil rights movement is really, really young. I think, you know, 60 years ago, the, you know, slavery was, you know, 150 years ago. So this, this whole, everything is really young. So if we don't start talking about this, um, you know, um, in, you know, some dialogue, intense dialogue, I think we won't get over it at, um, as as Americans, and I think there always will be a divide unless we can make some changes. And to make changes, we have to we have to start talking. Well, I want to thank you so much, Ayo Henderson, for shining a light on a part of a Black American history that we just aren't aware enough of. Wish you the best of luck in your project. Thank you again. And like I said, you go to indiegogocom slash as American as baseball to uh, go check out some trailers and, and donate if you'd like. And if not, just uh, send it on to a friend or somebody okay. that you'd like to to see it. My guest, Ayo Henderson. And he is the director of the documentary As American as Baseball. This is Uprising. Bipasha Shom is our senior producer. Anna Buss is our assistant producer. Michael Casey is our research intern. Alexander Hobbs is our technical director. Christian Beck is our production assistant. Federico Garcia, Kiana Turner, and Jonathan Alexander are our audio engineers. Camilo Ramirez is our sound editor. And Annie Mendoza is our social media coordinator. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Uprising with Sonali. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. Our theme music is by Quetzal. I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host and executive producer of Uprising. I'll see you tomorrow.